Good evening. And welcome to Q&A. Well, many people spend their lives considering big questions about the meaning of life and the existence of God. Well, tonight we've got less than an hour. But we do have a very good panel. One of Australia's leading Catholic intellectuals, Father Frank Brennan. Renowned journalist and atheist, Christopher Hitchens, who's in Australia to deliver the opening address at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. Social commentator and founding editor of The Monthly, Sally Warhaft. And uh, politics lecturer and former spokesman for the Islamic Council of Victoria, Walid Ali, and deputy director of the Sydney Institute, biographer and commentator, Anne Henderson. Please welcome our panel. OK. Now, remember that Q&A is live from 9.30 Eastern Time, so join the Twitter conversation. And send your questions by SMS to 197 or to our website at abc.net.au slash Q&A. Well, as we go to air tonight, there are reports that thousands may have died in the earthquakes and tsunamis that ravaged our region in the last few days. Well, these sorts of tragedies inevitably raise questions like our very first one, which comes from Ed Jart Menis. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, speak to Mr. Hitchens. Thank you very much. I've noticed that you're wearing the Kurdistan flag again on your lapel. And, um, we might come as, to that later, Edja. The Kurdish <laughs> also. I really, really thank you very much for that, uh, for your solidarity to the Kurdish people. Uh, my question is that um, thousands of people dying from earthquakes, uh, to the panel question, thousands of people dying from earthquakes can't be called God's punishment. Why is it that a person being saved from under the rubble days later is um, almost invariably called a miracle? And um, also, why should God be credi uh, credited for a um, good act of a human being, saving a fellow, fellow human being from under the rubble, while um, uh, God being spared for the, um, um, for the calamity that, uh, that was brought upon the people? Yes. Look, um, I promise you I did not have anything to do with planting this guy in the audience <laughs> and giving me such a brilliant opening. He, he even recognises that I'm wearing in my lapel the flag of free Iraq. The Kurdish people like it. Uh, perhaps you're a Kurd yourself, I don't know, but if not, even better. Um, in England, there are, I think, only three villages that don't have a war memorial from the First World War. One of them is called Upper Slaughter, by the way. It's in, it's in, it's in the Cotswolds. I think there are only three or four that don't... I used to, when I was a kid, I used to notice it, and, of course, anyone who's been to an Anzac Day event will feel the same way, this unbelievable horror show. Uh, and culling of the young. Do you know what those villages are called by the Imperial War Graves Commission? They're called the Blessed Villages. What's blessed about being the only village in a war which was fought for God, King and Country, which didn't have any casualties? And what does it make all the villages that did lose dozens or sometimes more than that of young men, frequently every male member of the family? Are they cursed because they did what the church and the king asked them to do? It's, it's probably the stupidest thing the human race does is to look for patterns in this way and say when a baby falls out of a high-rise building and bounces on the grass below, that must be God. And when uh, millions of children die every day for the lack of pure drinking water and just die of diarrhoea in a banal manner, that's because God moves in a mysterious way or isn't involved at all. So I think we're off to a racing start, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> on the key question, anyway. Frank Brennan, uh, let's hear from you. Do you have any thoughts on the role of an omnipotent God in natural disasters? Natural disasters happen and an omnipotent God lets them happen if, for those of us who believe in God. Uh, it's not about God saying that we won't let nature take its course. Uh, those of us who do have a religious faith, we equally, I think, are committed to science. But like Christopher says, we all look for patterns we look for patterns in our daily lives, we look pat for patterns in our histories, we look for patterns in the world. And yes, some villages might be called blessed. Well, if they didn't lose anyone, they wouldn't call themselves cursed. And so what, how do they Only see the themselves? Only the people who call them blessed could do that, because it's the natural corollary. Now, several leaders of the Christian church, as you know, said about the last tsunami that it was a punishment. In Britain, several of them said it was a punishment for homosexuality. Um, uh, that, it used to be said uh, that uh, earthquakes were a punishment for sodomy. Since we're doing sodomy in the lash, I thought I might as well bring this up. <laughs> Oddly enough, the San Francisco earthquake only hit when San Francisco was famous for other things. <laughs> when New Orleans got flooded, the only bits that didn't get flooded were the red light district. Okay? So anyone who says they know God's mind in this had better 
not mind looking a bit foolish. <laughs> or, which you obviously don't, or uh, had better say, take responsibility, <laughs> take responsibility and say, yes, by letting it happen, God must in some way wish it to. Let me bring uh, Waleed... Why would you uh, do that? Let, let me bring Waleed Ali into the discussion here. Do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, well, and, and does Islam have a, a concept uh, of a God uh, that allows disasters to happen? Well, I think by definition, if you believe in God you would have to say that at the very least God allows this thing to happen because to say otherwise would be to, to presuppose that God lacks the power to stop it, which I, I don't know of any religious tradition, certainly no monotheistic religious tradition that would say that. I do want to say something that I definitely agree with in what Christopher said, and that is that this sort of very simple dichotomised thinking about natural disasters, that they are punishment or reward, and this is the prism through which we view them. I mean, this, this has to be some of the most... Uh, rudimentary, unsophisticated thinking that religious people and, frankly, irreligious people who perpetuate it even via criticism have ever produced. I think it's a ridiculous assertion. And I've not really encountered a serious religious thinker as opposed to one who is too busy playing forms of identity politics or some other kind of rabble-rousing, uh, persecuting some rabble-rousing religiosity, who would argue that. The, the simple fact is that things happen in life that are in our, in our subjective experiences, grotesque and other things that are wonderful. And our judgments immediately about whether they're grotesque and wonderful are, in a sense, beside the point. The question, I think, for religious people who are actually serious about being religious people and with all the introspection that that implies, is what do you do about it and what do you do with it? It's possible that by surviving the earthquake and moving on to behave in all sorts of ways that you cast yourself into some kind of eternal destruction in religious terms. That's entirely possible, in which case you probably would have been better off to have been killed in the earthquake. Um, it's entirely possible that by gathering all sorts of riches in life and having a, an easy life, that you are similarly um, just deforming your character as a person. So I think the, the, the key question is not so much what is God doing, um, although that's a perfectly legitimate question for a um, field of inquiry. But I think the more important question for people, particularly religious people, is who am I in response to this? What am I doing? Each of these is a test, uh, whether you're on the good side or the bad side of it, and what do you do with it? And I'm more interested in that, frankly. Let's hear from Anne Henderson. Well. Well, where I come from, um, I can't take too much of the God is a person or a thing or a human creation. I mean, the idea of religion is a human creation, and I grew up a Catholic, and we had heaps of that little pictures of what God was. But God is meaning beyond meaning, and the reason so many human beings have kept on believing in a God is because so much of ordinary material existence here doesn't explain things enough. And whether God had anything to do with natural disasters, I'm really not very interested. It's, it's a question of when people can't understand something, they give, give a force, a place in their understanding, which is usually something spiritual or beyond the material. And to me, what God is is not so important, but what God, that idea of God, leads people to do. When the um, New Orleans tragedy happens, one of the, the most uh, heroic acts was the way the Salvation Army was, was there on the, on the spot the minute it happened. I spent three and a half years going to Villawood Detention Centre and got very much involved, as Frank did, with the, re uh, the so-called illegal um, people that came to Australia um, without visas and trying to get them visas. When I went to the yard, which was a very unpleasant place to be in every week, it wasn't the Fabian Society or the Pacifist Society that was there helping people, but invariably it was older nuns, um, people who had some connection with the Anglican Church. We sat down, um, people who believed in Islam, people who believed in Christ, people who believed in uh, anything you could think of, and we were all kind of in the same boat together. But it was interesting how it was those that had some faith um, who had the time too, no doubt, who were there helping. And, and to me it's... Was as this a private institution? Well, 
private what institution? The one you were visiting was. The I was visiting detention. a detention centre run by the government. Um, people who came to us, or still, it's, it was a policy brought in by the Labor government and continued um, under the Liberal government and continues to this day. Now we take people to Christmas Island. Which and is off I'm the going coast. to interrupt you, and, and for a moment, that was a and sorry, interrupt thing. everyone just yeah. for a moment, because we actually have a question mm. uh, that's coming up that uh, that actually leads us in similar directions. But you're watching a special politician-free edition of Q and A, answering the big philosophical questions. The clock is ticking. Let's move to our very next question. It comes from Joel Brown. Uh, my question is to uh, Mr Hitchens again. Um, how do you account for the uh, good work, uh, specifically regarding the title of your book, uh, Religion Poisoning Everything, uh, the good work done by uh, religious aid organisations overseas in third world and developing countries, as well as um, locally um, on our own shores and I'm sure in, in your country uh, with the homeless and the needy? Actually, That's Christopher, can I interrupt? Before, I, before you answer that, think about your answer for a moment. I, we haven't heard from Sally Warhaft. I'd like to bring her in and then go to you. Uh, I think this gets into the whole question of... of uh, the whole argument about whether or not, you know, God is great or not great. And Christopher's argument, obviously, um, in his book, to me, what, what's missing, and I think what Waleed touched on... Um, is that lived experience of people is much more varied and 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 great and personal um, than the, the kind of things that you can pick out to make a case against God or that um, you know God is somehow missing from a national a great disaster or tragedy, but he's there in a uh, in in a miracle. And I, I just think that um, you know. He's, he's, the lived experience of, of people who are, are religious uh, is, is it's part of what it is to be human, it seems to be, um, for a great, great many people across time, and I don't think it's something that's going to go away. Christopher. Well, this is why, in the, towards the tail of the last question, I asked the lady from the Sydney Institute uh, whether these Anne. institutions she's talking about... I'm Anne. <laughs> well, I don't know you well enough yet. I'll just um, introduce myself. I'm Perhaps Anne. we'll be more bonded by and the end of Some would say not much of a lady. Could be, we'll, be more, <laughs> we'll be more intimate by the end None of None of us would say that. Well, I know people who would. <laughs> It's just, it's just not the way oh, I was brought up. Yeah. Perhaps by the end of the <laughs> show, we'll be more intimate. Um, well, I asked her about because she she wasn't content just to say religious people volunteer for charity, as if that was news to anybody. But she had to couple it with a smear against Fabianism and social democracy. Now, as a matter of fact, well, they weren't the, there, Christopher. That's I'm all so I was sorry saying. to say I that without say it was no, a the, smear. Effort, the, fa the efforts of Fabianism. But you're good at you, smears. The efforts of Fabianism. What's wrong with a smear? I, I don't. I'll get to the end of this sentence if it kills you. <laughs> <It'll come out. laughs> Um, the efforts, the efforts of socialists and social democrats to make sure that things like education and health do not depend upon private charity given by rich people and religious institutions to the deserving poor are the reasons why a lot of it's taken care of because it's taken care of. Hang because on, I wasn't we rich. have welfare and... But just a minute, there's another smear. I wasn't a rich person giving charity where it wasn't gone. And you have to understand the I didn't the say problem. that you were. Well, it seemed to come across I didn't that even way. imply that you were. No, the, the efforts of Fabianism and social democracy, socialism, were to make sure that these things didn't depend on the voluntary whim... Yeah, but they don't do and that did now. ..and all the idea of the deserving poor. Now, that's okay. the first point. I know point. about The second point... I, well... Because it's so taken for granted now, I love to remind people, actually, this that meant... That was a long time This ago. meant social political action, as Hang you correctly say, as you quite correctly say, and I can help you out here by emphasising it, quite a while ago. Mm. That's why I said not to forget it. Now, to the point about religious activis activism, isn't it true, haven't you all heard, that Hamas does so well because it supplies social services? Are you going to say that it's the same is true for... Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Never mind that they're religious, they distribute services where otherwise there'd only be secularism and corruption. Well, if you want to claim that, you can't just claim the charitable part of it, it seems to me. Mother Teresa, endlessly praised for work that most of the time she actually never did. I went to watch her very closely in Calcutta. You don't mind that she thinks that what Bengal and Calcutta mainly needs is a campaign, a clerical campaign, against birth control and family planning. Has anyone here ever been to Bengal and concluded that's what it really needs? <laughs> that's what she was really campaigning for, in case you're worried. But never mind. She gives a wonderful impression of being a charitable person. So what Indians need is more missionaries to cure poverty, when everybody knows there's only one cure for poverty, which is the empowerment of women, which means giving them some control over their reproduction. <laughs> Mainly... 
<laughs> you name me a Catholic or Muslim charity that goes into the fields determined to secure the empowerment. Okay, of women. well, let, let's and see, you'll have the ghost of a point. Let's see if Frank Up Brennan. Until now, you don't. Let's see if Frank Brennan can uh, address that point. <laughs> well, let's take it. I mean, people like Amartya Sen have argued very strongly and persuasively, like yourself, Christopher, that empowerment of women is the key to the development of peoples. Now, why don't we just drop the bagging and smearing and saying, all right, anyone who's out there, let's judge them by their fruits, whether they're atheists or whether they're Catholics or whatever, let's drop the bagging and smearing, let's say, right, we agree, what we've got to be working for is the empowerment of women. Mm -hmm. And there are people of religious dispositions who are passionately committed to that. And yes, there will be mistakes made in terms of policies and in terms of moral theories, but that's where I think in a pluralist society like Australia, we can have the respectful dialogue and we can work those things through as we do this evening. Wally Dully. Uh, just trying to figure out which aspect to take. I, I think... <laughs> uh, but, uh, I guess that uh, the argument being made in that question is religion doesn't poison everything because there are people who yeah. do good works. I think, I think there's a, a real call that needs to be made for some honesty here on the part of religious people. And that is that, yes, lots of religious people do lots of very good things. Uh, and there was research published, I think, two years ago looking at Generation Y Australians that found that uh, those who were more religiously committed were more socially aware, they were more committed to the social good and all that sort of thing. And you can point to those studies and you can say that's wonderful. Um, but in a sense, I think you get caught in a reactionary argument, which is with all these people lining up saying, look how horrible religion is, you get a religious response that says, no, 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 we're good, look at these charities, turning a blind eye to not only some of the points that Christopher raises, but also the fact that there are religious charities that do a lot of that religious work for their own ends that, in my judgment, are actually quite nefarious at times. <laughs> religious can be, religions can be used as a cover and a pretext for violence and evil and all sorts of things. It can be instrumentalised in that way. It can also be instrumentalised in the opposite way. And so I kind of echo what what Father Frank Brennan's said here, and that is that if you actually look at the substance of what people are doing, rather than asking the first question, is this a religious organisation or is this not, and then trying to make some judgement about their conduct and their motives on the basis of that, then I think you get further down the track of making some kind of assessment. I think we're caught in these petty games about, well, you know, are religious people good or bad? Just get on with being good or being bad and let people make up their own. <laughs> That's excellent. I, I think that's, I really think that's brilliantly phrased, but there is one more thing we have to say, just to do with a logical inference. Um, if Catholic charities were better than I say they were, or Muslim ones, it still wouldn't have anything to do with the truth or otherwise of their preachments. Any more than a group like Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, which would be my favourite uh, medical charity, or Amnesty International, which is completely secular, uh, proves that there is no God. I mean, it's, it's purely coincidental. That's an entirely separate argument. Well, but, well, but, the, but if the yeah, question but it just, is... It's, a, it's part of the premise that needs to be... No, but if the question is about... Okay, no, I'm going to interrupt you all, because uh, there, is, <laughs> there is a... Uh, there's a questioner, and uh, Christopher Hitchens obviously has uh, got a lot of attention uh, from our audience, and here's a question aimed directly at him. Oh, dear. Um, it's from Jessica Langrel. Uh, just another one to Mr Hitchens. Um, you typically stereotype religious people as dogmatic and fundamentalists. No, I don't. Um, how is this when people who listen to you um, feel as if you're the one being dogmatic and fundamentalist in your evangelical pursuit to convert the world to atheism. Well, I have to... I would have expected more applause for a cheap point like that. <laughs> um, that's more like... Now, that's more like what I call applause for a joke. Um, I will have to, uh, Tony, put myself in the safekeeping of your audience for tonight. Uh, here, physically, and those who are watching, and ask them if they really think that's what I do or what I'm like, and that the reason the questions come to me, all of them, so far, is not just because of my sexual charisma. <laughs> um, but, but if it was that uh, all this, uh, the, the, this description of me as dogmatic and my only uh, description of others as being dogmatic was true, then I wouldn't be able to correct it in the time of this show. Christopher, just uh, getting to the point of why religion still resonates, here's a quote uh, from your book for you to reflect on. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world. It is the spirit of a spiritless situation. Yes. 
is, is the uh, opiate of the people, the quotation goes on. Um, and it, and it, it goes on even more beautifully to say that... Um, <laughs> no, it's not from me. It's not from me. It, it goes on to say uh, that criticism of religion has plucked the flowers from the chain, not so that men and women may wear the chain without consolation, but so that they may break the chain and cull the living flower. It's, it's from Karl Marx. It's the opening of the, his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. It's the most misrepresented quotation probably of the 19th century. It's the one where he doesn't say religion is the opium of the people. But he does it's the one that shows that atheists are not dogmatists. But he does understand, essentially, in making that point, why religion yes. still resonates today. He, he understands why religion is ineradicable, why it's part of the human makeup and, and personality, and why um, it's the most interesting argument that we have, because it's the, it's the, it was our first attempt at philosophy, just as it was our first attempt at healthcare, cosmology, astronomy, and so on. It's the, it's the argument that never goes stale. But I think one of the strengths of your book is that you do concede that religion is ineradicable. Oh, so, yeah. given that reality, I mean, I come back to the point, why not drop the bagging and smearing, and let's say the solvent is respectful public discourse. But you... We judge things by their fruits, and if there be arguments which are put, which are misconceived, then we talk that out. OK, hang well, on, Father, I'm just going to You're the, soul, you're the soul of charity, but, I mean, who's been bagging and smearing? And you've said that twice now. As if you're sitting there, our only protection against a wave of smearing and bashing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, I thought that if, as, as long as we have a civil conversation, we don't have to keep on saying that that's what we're doing. OK, uh, in, this, in this civil conversation, we have an audience. We've got a gentleman up there with his hand up, and I'm going to come to you. This question's for Chris and for Waleed. Um, you, uh, Frank, sorry, Frank and Waleed, um, you said that we live in a pluralistic society, we're uh, a duality society. What is your views on gay marriage and, and why is it there seems to be such opposition from the Christian and Muslim <coughs> societies against it? OK, we'll take a quick answer from Frank and Waleed on that. I've just finished a national human rights inquiry. We've heard about this constantly around the country. <laughs> I would approach the issue of gay marriage uh, distinguishing two things. One, people of a religious disposition may have a view about what they call the sacramentality of marriage. I would see that as a separate question from the civil institution of marriage. Now, in terms of the civil institution of marriage, I think one of the welcome developments in Australia is we've got to the stage of saying that discrimination against people on the grounds of their sexuality should be wiped out completely and that we're a better society for that being the case. In terms of the next step, whether or not in civil law there should be a recognition of the bond between two men or two women as being the same as marriage as it's presently understood, the real issue, I think, is whether or not that decision is best made by our elected politicians or whether it's made by unelected judges. And I think at the moment in Australia the view has been that that should be a decision of our elected politicians. My own view is moving around the country. I think that younger Australians, they don't see it as a problem. It's not an issue. I think for a lot of older Australians, it's still an issue. And guess what? A lot of them happen to be married. So in terms of a free and democratic society, for those who are civilly married, then we've got to bring them with them, with us, as we look at any change on that issue. All right, before I go to anyone else on that, uh, you're watching Q&A. Uh, we actually have a, a video question that's uh, going to, uh, uh, I think, continue this discussion. We're watching Q&A. Remember, you can send your web or video questions to our website. The address is on the screen. Like this video from Joseph Bromley of Malmesbury, Victoria. Hello, comrades. <laughs> can we ever hope to live in a truly secular society? when the religious maintain their ability to affect political discourse and decision-making on issues such as voluntary euthanasia, same-sex unions, abortion and discrimination in employment. Uh, Christopher, this won't mean anything to you, but uh, I was a bit distracted by that because he looks enormously like a young Malcolm Turnbull. I'll just repeat his question. <laughs> oh, I was thinking Sid Barrett, actually. Can we ever hope to live in a truly secular society when the religions maintain their ability to affect political discourse and decision-making on issues like voluntary euthanasia, same-sex marriage, abortion and discrimination in employment. Wally Dali. Uh, I frankly don't understand the question. Well, I do literally understand the question, but I, I, there are assumptions embedded within it that I think need to be examined. I actually think a secular society implies the ability of 
religious arguments to enter the discourse. The idea of secularism, the reason for it coming into existence, was to open the public discourse to a range of views, religious, irreligious, and otherwise. It's about the separation of church and state. That is, it's about removing the levers of government, the levers of power, from an inst a religious institution like the church. That's a different thing from saying that arguments that have their grounding in some kind of religious commitment cannot be aired. That, to me, is actually an anti-secular position because what it's doing is it's saying, here are the, uh, the, the approved modes of discourse, here are the approved arguments. The idea of, of a secular society is to say, you come, if you want to come from a socialist perspective, if you want to come from a, a Christian perspective, an Islamic perspective, a Hindu perspective, or some other perspective that as yet has not been conceived, fine. And we'll sort that out in the, in the political process. I think to say, on euthanasia, religious people uh, are not allowed to comment as religious people is, is ridiculous and anti-secular and anti-liberal. OK. Sally Warhart. I, I, I agree with everything Waleed said. If, if what the question was meant to ask was, you know, as meaning a you know, society without religion, then I'd say you want to be careful what you wish for and... Uh... He, perhaps, he Perhaps he's talking about a society without politicians who <laughs> are uh, expressly religious. Well, and then therefore... maybe we should all be praying very hard for that. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, you know, I mean, you imagine... Or voting very hard for that's, it. That's right. I mean, that, that, and, I mean, what Waleed said is absolutely true. Secularism means everybody can uh, get involved and it's, uh, I mean, it's a great thing about a country like this. Um, and, but, you know, you imagine back in time. I, I don't want to imagine a, uh, a, a world that never had Mozart or Bach in it, you know. You have to be careful what you ask You're for. You're not religious, though. Why do you value religion? Because I think that I'm interested in, in, in what drives human beings, in what makes human beings human. Um, and, and I think there is obviously, whether you're religious or not, there is something in human beings that, um, that, 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 that passions and faith override reason in just about everything we do. From we, we get up in the morning and we choose what to wear, or you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot that's going on in human behaviour that is not that well thought out. And in fact, a lot of our reason is is in analysis. It's after it's after the fact. And um, I think that none the worse for that, though. I mean, no, uh, well, that's you need both. You know, though it's true there aren't many secular Gothic cathedrals, for example. <laughs> But How, uh, Verdi, Verdi could write a beautiful. What do you call the Kremlin? Verdi, Verdi could write a very, very good requiem without actually being a believer. But I don't think that John Donne could have written his sacred poetry not thinking. I don't really believe any of this. I mean, it's quite clear that there's a, there's an instinct in all of us for the for the numinous and mm -hmm. the transcendent. You might say. I, I think you can have it without the supernatural. Um, in fact, I think you have to. Well, again, I couldn't agree more with, if I may call you, may I call you one in? Well, they that that's what secular means. But um, in that case, I think it, uh, it, it, it behooves the religious to say what they genuinely mean. Now, Frank just talked about homosexuality as if the church had never condemned it as a mortal sin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. it's extraordinary. <laughs> Um, I, I would not know that you were a member of the Society of Jesus, except that it was a very Jesuitical point you were making. <laughs> <laughs> and concealed, so you, and concealed you your main one. And I'm sorry, well, it is the same. The Islam says the same. You cannot be yeah. a good Muslim and publicly be a homosexual. Why don't Absolutely. you, given the, given the wonderful freedom of a secular conversation, where no one's going to say anything about your right to say it, why don't you say what you actually think? Mm. How about that? <laughs> okay, okay, yes, yes, Anne, and then I'd love to hear from you. That what I find interesting about your book, Christopher, is that everyone's the same and yet we're all violently different. And if you are a cultural Catholic as I am, I don't listen to what the Pope says every day and take my guide from him. My mother, who's 84, says she had a, a Vatican bypass 30 years ago. You know, <laughs> it, it isn't like you see. Maybe because you're not a believer, you don't understand that... Sounds within, like progress of a kind. With, no, but <laughs> she, she converted from a, a completely non-believing family when she was about 20. But the, the thing is that... Religion is so manifestly pluralist as well. I mean, there's so many different ways in which people see God. And even within the Catholic Church, there's violently different um, ways in which people practice their faith. Did you say and violently? The idea... <laughs> I missed that. You did say violently. 
Well, violence. Well, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you on all that that you say about violence among religion, and and that's the point. There's a, I like the old Greeks and the Romans. You had a god of war and a god of peace, and you know you had different kind of gods. I like that. But the, the idea that we're all following the Pope, I think, is a bit misguided. OK, uh, I've got, I want to... You're well, either a Roman Catholic or not. You can be tons of kinds of Catholic. Oh, you'd be surprised. There are several... There are five Popes I know about. There's a Coptic Pope, there's an Eastern Pope... There's no, all right. Well, I'm most, talking about the one in Rome. It's not accepting the authority um, of the Holy Father. I, I leave it to... Uh, this father, but I mean, I think that's not. I think since about people who, 1969, people who take their faith a la carte and cafeteria style don't impress me very much <laughs> on the points of principle and conviction Look, that we're supposed if, to be talking about. If Catholics were following the Pope, they'd all have ten children. They don't. Well, Frank that's a, Brennan, that's, a, that's, can a, that's can I, a start too. Can I, can I hear Frank <laughs> Brennan on the, the, the progress of the, the, the fundamental point that uh, Christopher Hitchens made, which is uh, how can you? say something which is clearly against the teachings of your church, clearly against the teachings of the Pope? I haven't said anything clearly against the teaching of my <laughs> church or against my Pope. Uh, I have drawn a distinction so, between... But hang on a sec. Is, 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 homo is homosexuality a sin or otherwise? And is, if it is a sin, is it the sort of sin that would see you go to hell according to Roman Catholicism? No. Uh, homosexuality is not a sin. It's a, it's a disposition. Uh, if you want to <laughs> argue... <laughs> If you want to argue about whether particular homosexual acts are appropriate for an individual in a moral context, that would require a pastoral discussion with that individual. What we were discussing previously was what should be the law in a civil society such as Australia where you have people of different religious convictions. And the question was whether or not there should be same-sex marriage. Now, that is not an issue which is resolved by determining what the Catholic Church says to its own members it regards as moral or immoral. They're quite distinct questions. Uh, Wally Daly, uh, you're on the same question, if you like. Um, is, is homosexuality a sin in Islam? I'll get to that. The, the thing I want to say... No, no, no. no. <laughs> What I know, but there's a point. There's an important distinction here, and this is, I get often frustrated with this discourse of lumping the Islamic tradition in with the Christian tradition, particularly the Catholic tradition, because they're structurally so fundamentally different. The Catholic tradition has a church which has a, a kind of divine imprimatur and authority. The Islamic tradition is a far more anarchic tradition in a sense. Uh, there is no centralised authority, especially in the, the Sunni tradition. So to say the Islamic teaching on anything is X, is a position that immediately becomes contestable. You can try to verify it statistically or otherwise, but the point is that at the very least in theory, if not in practice, any position that you take is a position that you take that may or may not, that, that may be fallible and is open to being contested by other Islamic theologians or, or other Muslims and so on. So on any question, whether it be homosexuality or it be anything, you will find a position that the, the majority take. And on the question of homosexuality, undoubtedly, if you, if you took a poll in the Muslim world, uh, you would find that most people would consider it sinful behaviour. But uh, if you took... Dodging it. It's not the, what Muslims think, it's what Islam teaches. Yeah, but, okay, but my question, is, my question is, what exactly dodging is it. your repository of a, a list of Islamic uh, conclusions? There is no book called Islamic Law. There is no Islamic body that says... Uh, this is what Islam teaches. It, is, it's an, it has, for 1,400 years, been an ongoing conversation. So, and what Ongoing was... conversation is very good. Yeah, and that, and, and my, but that's my point. If, if there is a criticism I would make of the Muslim world, it is this. It is that, particularly in the post-colonial era, as religion has become an identity movement rather than something that's actually anything to do with spirituality and faith, in my view, um, particularly in the post-colonial world, that religiosity, Islam has become instrumentalised as a list of conclusions, as a political ideology, as though there is some manifesto you can just download from a computer and install into a society. It doesn't work that way, certainly not in the classical tradition. The classical tradition was one of constant debate. That's why uh, it was very difficult to get something like an inquisition going. We managed it at some point, but it was not terribly successful and it ultimately <laughs> crumbled because you can't ultimately centralise authority uh, to make definitive statements on behalf of God in the Islamic tradition. That's an act of polytheism to do that right, in the Islamic I'm tradition. I'm just going to uh, interrupt the flow for a minute because we have another question tonight. It comes from Hedy Crichton. 
Uh, yes, my question is for Christopher Hitchens. Um, with many voters using a politician's religious persuasion to influence their vote, do you expect to see in your lifetime an openly atheist politician be appointed to the head of government, for example, for Australia, Britain or the United States? Uh, I'm not going to let Christopher answer this immediately. I'd <laughs> rather uh, throw it around the panel first. Uh, Frank Brennan. I think undoubtedly. I mean, perhaps not so readily in the United States, uh, or if in the United States the presidential candidate were atheist, he or she would probably still proclaim some religious conviction in that that's part of the United States. But I think here in Australia, whether or not one of our political leaders I would think was an atheist or of a religious persuasion, I think is almost an irrelevance to the Australian community. OK, let's hear from Anne Henderson on that. I mean, uh, I oh. can't think of any atheist uh, prime ministers, Australian prime ministers to date. You might, you might well, know. It's certainly not openly did atheist. Did Goff openly proclaim he was a believer? But anyway, the, the, it's not, not so Bork. much... It's not so much um, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or a believer, it's what you say to the people you are. I find it interesting at the moment, and I wouldn't have thought it would have happened in the 1980s, that all leaders of countries in the West um, seem to want to go to church every Sunday. Um, Christian churches. It was interesting that Tony Blair wouldn't be, wouldn't take um, on being a Catholic. I think he's is he considering it now? He's to, done it. He became a Catholic now after he left um, his position as Prime Minister. The problem with uh, democratic politics is and spin and 24-hour news and whatever. The person who inevitably comes to lead the country, and I think that questioner had had it um, had it right, is going to have to reflect the strength of belief in the country itself. So if you went around like Christopher, bagging all the churches and anyone who believed, I think it'll be a long time before that happens and I would be very surprised if it ever did happen. You could be an, a, an atheist, but I don't think you'd go around telling everyone that you thought everyone that was a believer was an idiot. Sally Warhope. I think there is... <laughs> there is um, I think there's just no way the Again, United States... Again, applause for a cheap point. It's encouraging. I think that there is no way the United States would elect a president uh, who was not a practising uh, Christian of some sort in my lifetime. I just cannot see it. I mean, interestingly, they, they were ready to elect a woman, and I think they, they would have if there hadn't have been a... Um, uh, an Obama there, but, but there's just no way. I, I, in fact, I think that's probably going backwards um, in, in American culture at the moment. Australia, I don't think people could care less. Christopher. Well, my only point would be... Um, I'll make a quick point about the United States. It, it, it's, a, it's a good thing that you, the atheists are not banned from holding the, the office because we would have missed uh, Mr Lincoln, for example. Um, and in my opinion, Mr Jefferson and one or two other people probably worth having. Who but as late, as, late as, as late as the, as, uh, in England, uh, the life of uh, James Stuart Mill, in America, the life of Benjamin Franklin, they were quite well-known, publicly, you think, secure, confident, uh, professional thinkers who didn't say, didn't think it was advisable to let people know what they thought in public because that's how dangerous it could be in a pious regime. And it seems that, and all, all people of faith can apparently congratulate themselves upon it, that uh, faith still demands uh, professions of faith by people who don't hold it that are by definition hypocritical. So congratulations to religious opinion for bringing that beautiful thing about in what's supposed to be a secular democracy. OK, no doubt we'll, uh, we're going to come back to uh, religious questions shortly, but you're watching Q&A, the unpredictable program where you get to ask the questions. If you'd like to ask a question in person, go to our website, register to join the studio audience. We'll change subjects now for a while. Our uh, next question comes from William McKenzie. Is great talent an excuse for paedophilia? What are the panel's opinions on the Roman Polanski situation in Switzerland and America at the moment? Waleed. Can, can someone explain to me why... I actually don't understand the argument that he shouldn't be brought before a court. I just don't understand it. Right. I'm, mm. I, I'm, I'm happy for someone to convince me. Well, there's an I'm, argument in France. He's very talented, so he shouldn't therefore <laughs> face trial. No, but have you caught right. up with the news? It's all changed. Um, it's changed today, which was interesting. The, the French have backed off. Uh, Hillary Clinton has said it's a legal matter. Uh, the Pol Polish leader, I think, has backed off, even though he's married to someone who's supporting um, Polanski. And uh, a Hollywood serious communicator has a blog or something where the anti-Polanski 
uh, responses are running 100 to 1 and the New York Times has come out and argued against him, which is an interesting phenomenon. So maybe it's changing. Can, can I, say there's I don't know there's why it would be interesting. I mean, I just can't believe they, they wouldn't argue that he should no. be tried. I, I was reading his autobiography last night and uh, Polanski's account of, you know, making love to this young woman on Jack Nicholson's couch. It was just mm. a, um, you know... So it, why has it taken so long? That's, well, that's, where, the, that's where the talent comes in. Yeah. Rem, rem, rem arcu chetagusti, as they say in Latin. You touch the point with a needle. He's already had the rewards mm. of being talented. Mm. 30 years on the lam, after, I'll say it directly, uh, fornicating with and sodomizing a 13 year old mm. to whom he had given narcotics mm. to yeah. lull her. Now, excuse me, you know, we do have our standards, even those mm. of us who don't believe we're being supernaturally super. <laughs> 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 Although the, the, the really sad thing is that this woman has come out and, and said that the, the trial by media um, that she's going to have to endure uh, in this is, is, she believes, will be worse than the actual crime, which is, uh, it, it's, it's a really sad uh, and terrible tale, this. But that, that's his fault too. That's yes, absolutely it is. It is. And, and, and he still needs to be tried, but it's awful that she's going to have to um, suffer. Uh, so she doesn't want it to define her whole life. For and, discussing and, this and yet he has to be... Tried. But, but it was his lawyers back. that brought this back mm. into the arena. Mm. And so, in a sense, this has been all brought about because late last year his lawyers tried to get through a loophole in the law to have his charges dropped. And, of course, that then set the prosecution out and running. Can I make a point and yeah. a sort of admission here? And uh, I'm, oh, almost sorry, surprised by, admission, I, I, I'm almost surprised <laughs> by the admission, which is Bring that, uh, well, uh, it's a simple one, really, that I've actually uh, been to see several of his films uh, in that period. I've watched others on... DVD, and, and when you think about it carefully, um, is that somehow supporting? You mean we'd, we'd have been deprived of the films if he'd been nabbed in the no, first place? No, not at all. I'm simply saying I wonder mm. why I didn't think about this at the time. Mm. Oh, well, because we're all capable of keeping two sets of books. I mean, that's mm. part of our nature. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can see that I'm not the only one. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, well, he, just for discussing this subject, a couple of years ago, my magazine, Vanity Fair, was sued by Mr Polanski from Paris, in London, not in, not in America, where he thought the jurisdiction would be easier on him. He didn't even have to appear in person, because he thought that might be risky. He made a video deposition. We claimed he had no reputation to defend. He walked away with a lot of our money on a libel judgment, saying this couldn't be discussed. So I would say, screw him. <laughs> <laughs> and I would add... And I would add, screw him for a chain. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Brennan. It's his turn. Going back to the question, I mean, what about the 13-year-old girl? Mm -hmm. I well, mean, she's saying no. Uh, but go back to then and, I mean, to speak of, you know, the talent of the one who is the perpetrator, what about the talent and what's happened to the victim? And what the law's got to be about is protecting the victim, whether or not she's talented. And if the perpetrator be talented, well, it counts for nothing. That's what justice according to law has to be Although, about. Although, sadly, you know, the stuff up of this means that it, it hasn't protected her at all. It, it's gone on for 35 years Can and I it could just, have all been yeah, over. There's a, there's a broader point as well that's not about the Polanski case, and this is where I get in my lawyer mode. It's about the integrity of the justice system. You cannot, I think, as a justice system, tolerate or reward someone just because they managed to get away with it for 30 years and say, oh, it was a long time ago. Well, no, there is a reason that the criminal law doesn't have a statute of limitations that applies to it by and large. Um, and, and that is because we deem crime to be of such significant import that it must be punished irrespective of, of how, what, what time has elapsed between the, the commission of the offence and, and the finding of, of the offender. There is, I, I just what we would say if it was a bishop. Well, of course. But I just cannot... I, I just no. probably, 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 what everyone, right. probably what everyone on the panel actually has been saying. So, uh, you're watching Q&A, the live and interactive forum where you ask the questions. Our next question comes from Bazda Yildic. Uh, why is it that the Islamic country, Iran, is the threat to the peace in the world and not the Zionist? Uh, is it America's support of Israel? Well, hundreds of people are getting killed uh, in Gaza and West Bank every day. Uh, with the support of America. The Israel-Palestinian war has been going on for 61 years and we are not actually looking at what, um, what is actually happening and 
we're fearing about what is not happening. Mm. We're fearing about something that hasn't happened. Mm. Okay, um, Sally Warhaf, you want to pick that up? And I might add, by the way, we had a number of questions asking why Iran's nuclear program and not Israel's mm. is the illegal one. Mm. Um, look, uh, this is, it's, it's, it's a tragedy. I, I, I think with Israel and Palestine, it, 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 it's something where it, it almost takes half an hour to sort out what, what has to happen. Uh, you know, the Palestinians need a state. Um, Israelis need to feel secure. Um, but it feels uh, like that's, it, it, it's just so far away. Um, I think that part of the problem is obviously the delicacy of the Israeli coalition. Um, I mean, I, I don't know um, beyond what I've just said that it, it's simple what has to happen, but how you make it happen and how you uh, make people want peace more than they want other things uh, is beyond me. Christopher Hitchens? It's become a familiar thing. I, I should perhaps preface this by saying that with Edward Said, the late uh, Professor Edward Said, I, I wrote a book about the rights of Palestinians and the way in, this, in which these have been negated by Israeli policy. But um, I know a lot of people in the Arab and Muslim world who are fed up with having the subject changed to Israel whenever human rights for them comes up. A very good example of this just last week in Tehran, where the government has an official Al-Quds Day, as it's called, the Day of Jerusalem, where school children and others are paraded. It's a more or less compulsory demonstration to say they'll give their blood and their lives for Palestine. And, and hundreds of thousands of Iranians turned up to say, no, we'll only give our blood for Iran, thanks. We're fed up with being told by the regime that they represent the oppressed of Palestine, that we can't talk. And, it, and they are having to shed their blood because the regime keeps on killing them for wanting to have a say in their own internal affairs. And a regime that does this and has just pulled off a, a blood-stained military coup uh, it's overturned the results even of an already predeterminedly fraudulent election that says that, the, the, that a, a woman's voice is worth that of only... Uh, th it, sorry, it takes three women in a court against one man um, that uses torture and rape as, uh, as policies in prison and so forth. You want a regime like that to have nuclear weapons? You're welcome. But you should say that's what you don't mind. Are you going to say that? Are you going to say you've no objection? That the real problem is the Jewish state? Come on, so, be serious. So, so you <laughs> So the Jewish state doesn't have nuclear weapons? Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, now, I appeal again to the fair-mindedness and intelligence of the audience. Did I say that? No, no but... Did I by any, in any way imply it? No, but... No. Did I not begin with a, a throat clearing, which I, I'll amplify if you will. <laughs> about my long record of work about this, my defence of the Israeli dissidents who published the news about Israel's illegal programme and gone to jail for it. I can refer you to all that if you like. What but my point was directed specifically to you. Yep. I said, does okay. this, in your mind, make the destruction of human rights in Islamic countries OK or not? No. Good. OK, no, let's, let's hear from Waleed. Well, that's progress of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I, I think, highlights the really difficult, I think, personally intractable situation that now confronts the world in dealing with uh, Iran's apparent nuclear weapons regime. And I hear today that the UN is still arguing that they're not developing weapons. But whatever you think about that, there is a problem because you do get questions like this, whether or not you agree with Christopher that there's a lack of moral seriousness about that question. You're always going to get that question. The minute the, the conversation turns to Iran, it is going to be deflected towards Israel. And so the problem is that if you're interested in disarming Iran or somehow reigning in that regime, it's very hard to do that in isolation without also engaging in some kind of agreement that's going to that's going to bring Israel into the into the mix. And of course the US who also have <laughs> nuclear weapons. I'm encouraged by the fact that President Obama is talking about a nuclear free world and that when he headed the, the UN or presided over the UN Security Council this week, which I think the first time an American president has ever done that, uh, the vote to rid the world of nuclear weapons was unanimous. That's, that's all good. But now the really, really tough politics starts, and that is the politics of dealing with an Iranian regime that, frankly, probably sees very little incentive, if any, to try to disarm or to become less evil. It's got 
every reason to remain as evil and perhaps have become even more evil than it is. And Israel is going to have to be part of that discussion, whether they like it or not, um, whether the US likes it or not, because without that, you, I just can't see how there's a way forward on it. Tony, I, sorry, I simply must say this. I'm really sorry. Um, implied in both what Walid has said and the lady questioner, is the idea that Iran is perfectly entitled to have nuclear weapons. At least as if Israel is, it is. No, no, that's not what I thought well, at all. Well, the Iranian government, don't let's forget, says it doesn't want them and isn't planning to have them. Mm. And so if it turns out they are, it's not a problem to do with Israel. It's to do with them breaking every undertaking they've ever made at the United Nations, every undertaking they've ever made to the International Atomic Energy Authority, every undertaking they've ever made to the European Union negotiators. It means that international law is completely meaningless. And yet... When Mr. Ahmadinejad tests missiles, he says this is part of our nuclear program. How is that part of a peace yeah, program? I, can I just say... Their party, their proxy party, Hezbollah... I've been to its rallies in Beirut. Do you know what the symbol of the party now is? What they put on the flag? A mushroom cloud. Uh, with a threat to the Jews uh, written underneath it. Can I, can now, I just say... Actually, when you go to meetings of uh, the American Jewish Committee, you don't Mr. quite get that propaganda. Christopher, hold on. We're just going to hear from Walid. Yeah, then yeah, uh, I, I'm going to go to another question, I, which is related. I think that's a bit of a gross misreading of what I was saying. I'm yeah. certainly not implying that. What I, but what I am saying is the real politic of dealing with this situation is that for the Iranian regime, if you put yourself in the position of the Iranian regime that has now become such a grotesque, deformed regime, that in a sense it has to perpetuate that deformity in order to survive. That's kind of the logic of those sorts of regimes. The minute you do that, they're now in a position where it's just going to be very hard to create the political environment for them to change course without dragging Israel in. Now, whether or not you want to say that Israel's uh, acquiring of nuclear weapons is equivalent to Iran's worse, better, whatever, that to me is not the point as far as real politics is concerned. How are you going to get that change to occur? without incorporating Israel into the conversation. That's Christopher, the uh, just a, 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 I'd like to sort of put a line under this, but I just want to ask you one question and a brief answer, if you can, if you could. Um, you mean I'm incapable of a brief answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be terse if I have to be. OK, we'll answer this Trying. tersely. Um, Israel, of course, uh, did try and stop uh, Iraq uh, acquiring nuclear weapons by bombing a reactor. Uh, would it be justified, in your opinion, for them to do the same uh, in Iran? What Israel did to the Osirak reactor was what the Iranians had tried to do. Everyone forgets this uh, with their own air force a couple of months before. The Iranians had a huge sigh of relief when the Israelis pulled off a raid they couldn't bring off themselves and disarmed Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in the Sunni Arab world, believe you me, who hope that the Israelis take out the, the Iranian one in turn. But they can't say so in public any more than the Iranians could before. My own view is that Israel both cannot and should not no. uh, attempt uh, such an attack. OK, well, we're going to move on again. Um, well, actually, look, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm going to take your question, you. lady in the front there. <laughs> look, my one question is basically, or my one comment, or passing comment, is that so many times you've brought up women in Islam. I'd just like to correct that I've read the Quran, and all Muslim scholars would agree with me that Islam gives women a lot of rights. We over and over give Islam, women in Islam through the Quran, I may not say it through individuals who preach the religion, but Islam through the Quran gives women a lot of rights and I need that to be heard. I need that to, to have everyone to understand and hear that. I mean, Absolutely. I am a young Muslim woman myself. I sit before you, I have a voice and I can speak to you and I can look you in the eye and I do have my rights. And when I go to Iran, I'm actually Iranian as well. So when I go to Iran, I also have my rights. I need it to be heard that the Quran, the Quran, Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us our rights. In people, individuals in countries and people who represent our religion may not, and they may do the wrong thing to um, sort of stand in front and show us religion and preach us religion, okay. but Islam does. All right. We're going to take that as a comment, a very passionate one at that. OK. I, well, no. You're, uh, hang on. No, we're not. No, we're not going to take it as a comment. I can, I can see your face, I can see your hair, and I can see you sitting in an audience with young gentlemen. Don't you tell me you can do any of that in Iran. I can, though. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you cannot. I can. In Iran. <laughs> in Iran. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, where I have you been, could, my I hair would see your be hair. out. My yep. hair would be out because my veil would be little. My hair would be out. It may be covered a little bit, but just like in, in, oh, in the on. Bible, in the letter to the Corinthians, okay. Okay. it says to cover your no, hair no. to be modest. It's a shame she my spoiled what could have been a perfectly be. good statement. All right, OK, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Would be there. I mean, you've been talking about these cheap, uh, cheap jokes and things throughout have, this if, whole if conversation, you but you're the only one you making insult, the cheap you comments. Insult, you insult your sisters in Tehran who are being beaten, who are being beaten and raped every day when you say that they have their rights in the Islamic Republic. It's an insult to the women of Iran. I do not. Okay. Okay. 
We're nearly out of time. You're watching Q&A live. If you'd like to join the audience, uh, register on our website. The address is on your screen, abc.net.au slash Q&A. We have one last question. It comes from Pam Collicott. Many non-believers facing death change their minds about religion. Is that fear or comfort? OK, we're going to have to have quick answers from everybody. Frank Brennan. It's often both. <laughs> Henderson. I would say exactly the same. It's again what I said before, where there is no meaning, people find, find God. And they, that's their comfort. And there's even supposed to be a God gene, I think someone thought of. And I don't understand it totally, and some part of me does. So, yeah, I would say I agree with Frank. It's fear and comfort. Wally Dully. Well, let's not ignore it. It's a perfectly rational decision to make at that point. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. I mean, you're on your deathbed, there's absolutely no point not believing in God at that point. Because uh, you might be right. You may as well jump on a team that, if it's wrong, who cares? You know? I, would, so, I would say God knows. I mean, you know, unless you're from a team that, you know, dies repeatedly. Yeah, Isn't there, uh, could you... When Voltaire was dying, a priest came and said, you should renounce the devil, and he said, this is no time to be making enemies. <laughs> But it's a, it's a, it's a religious uh, falsification that uh, people like myself scream for a priest at the end. David Hume very famously didn't, didn't and was witnessed by, by James Boswell not doing so. Uh, most of us go to our ends with dignity. If we don't, and if it is uh, the wish for fear or comfort, then both of these things are equally delusory, as religion is itself. And uh, I think what we've... Thank you. We've, uh, we've proven, I think, tonight that this kind of discussion is worth having, but that is all we have time for. I'm sorry to those people who still got their hands up. Please thank our panellists, Frank Brennan, Christopher Hitchens, Sally Warhart, yes, Wally Daly and Anne Henderson. Yes, all right. Next week. Next week, another iconoclastic panel, including the feminist author with dangerous ideas, Jermaine Greer, Ruin Transfer, Adman Todd Sampson, the Labour Party's Belinda Neal, and uh, <laughs> the Liberal Party backbench rebel Corey Bernardi. Uh, that's all we have at the moment. We'll have one more by then. Uh, so join us next Thursday for another great Q&A. Good night.